like to welcome you all here this afternoon on this Resurrection Sunday as we give praise and glory to our risen Lord who had conquered death and paid the price for our sins. And we'd like to welcome those, especially those who are visiting with us to this afternoon service. Let us now stand for the call to worship. Take it from Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. Congregation, on whom do you depend for your help and strength? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. Receive the Lord's greeting, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our song of adoration is number 95B, verses 1, 2, and 3. Our psalm meditation for this afternoon is taken from Psalm 101, which is page 636 in the Pew Bible, Psalm 101. We read the following words, a psalm of David. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is, blame, is blameless. O, oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look, and an arrogant heart I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord." Our song of reflection is number 101a, verses 1 through 3, 1, 2, and 3, and verse 5.
Let us now come to our God in congregational prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to into your presence this afternoon, giving you the praise and the glory. We celebrate our Lord conquering death, rising from the grave, and in 40 days ascended to heaven where all power and dominion and authority have been given to him who reigns over all. We thank you that we can indeed trust you, have confidence in you, that you are our refuge and that you are our strength, that you're ever present with us, that your eyes watch over us. We need not be afraid that we can put our confidence in you. Heavenly Father, we live in a world that's increasingly wicked, increasingly perverse, a world that laughs at your commands, that seeks to free itself from your law in order to live lawless lives, lives according to their own self-desires and, in order, in order, and according to their own self-pleasures. Our world lives a lie. But we know that Satan is the father of lies and that when we seek to reject you, we cannot expect to prosper. We will only breed destruction and grief and sorrow and pain. And so, Heavenly Father, as we gather again this afternoon and again pray, praise you and give you glory for the price that has been paid for our sin, we give praise to you for the life that you granted to us through your Holy Spirit that we live in you, in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord God, that you may bring indeed revival upon our land, that to so many churches that have closed may again be full, that people may plead for mercy for all of their sins. Heavenly Father, the times may seem hard and difficult, but with you, nothing is impossible. But whatever may come, whatever may be, may we trust that all these things are in your hands, our lives, our families, our communities, that you are God who watches over us and you are God full of grace and mercy and peace. Heavenly Father, we come to you with our many petitions. We, we pray for our expecting mothers as their unborn covenant children continue to be fearfully and wonderfully made by you. We pray that you may watch over them and take care of them. We also pray for your hand of care upon Jane, Jane Hamstra, Margie Kelstra, and John Benusing at Shalom Manor, that they may also experience your nearness, your strength, especially since they're not able to physically join us in worship, that you may be there with them and grant them your comfort. Heavenly Father, we also pray for Reverend Adrian Kalosian, as a church planter in Ventura, California. We pray for them as they gather for worship also this day. And we also pray especially for the grief that one of the members is, or the grief that they bear for one of the members that has suddenly passed away. And we thank you for your mercy and your comfort as they also see your hand sanctifying them and bringing them together in love during this time. We also pray for them, for their perseverance, for perseverance and renewal in the usual but urgent things such as being focused in their services and in prayer, especially for those who are not churchgoers in their community, that indeed they may be able to reach out and bring to them the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord, the only hope that we, can have, that we can have in this world. And Lord God, we also thank you for their ability to purchase a neighborhood church building, which they were leasing. And we thank you, Lord God, for the generous lending. You made it possible. And we pray that they may use their funds stewardly as they seek also to use this building. Lord God, we also thank you for your hand of mercy and protection in the accident that Dan Sigma had and Josh Emanuel in Nigeria and how much worse it could have been. And we thank you, therefore, for providing 
and that all things are well. Lord God, we also pray for the persecuted church in Pakistan. We pray for this young girl who was abducted, and we pray that you may indeed be there. We hear so much of persecu persecution in many countries, and we know that these situations can be very seriously, very serious, and we pray that you may indeed grant relief as we hear of all the struggles that have gone on and the kidnapping and the disappearance. And we pray, Lord God, that you may have mercy. And even as we pray for that situation in Pakistan, we also realize that persecution can very easily happen in our own land, that our government is lawless. It's a government that hates that which is good and pleasing in your sight. And so we pray, Lord God, that you may have mercy upon us, and that we may continue to proclaim the good news of salvation here in Canada, there in Pakistan, and other parts of the world, that the world may know that there is a Savior who lives, who rules, and that only through Him and in Him is their eternal life. Heavenly Father, we pray that you may bless us as we open up your word, that you may grant us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive the good news of salvation. Also this afternoon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of preparation is number 243, verses 1 through 4. 243, 1 through 4. We'll stand to sing. The scripture reading this afternoon is taken from Psalm 31, 
which is page 586 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 31. where we read the following words. To the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice me glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years of sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquities, my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors. And an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many terror on every side. As they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servants. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to show. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak instantly against the righteous, in pride and contempt. O how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, and work for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in the besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong. And let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. <clears throat> Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are times in Honduras when the violence level was very high. For a time, Honduras rated as one of the most violent countries in the world. And when you'd walk the streets and talk to the people, you could feel the tension, the fear from all the violence. And when that violence level would go down, you could feel that people were more relaxed, less tense. And as we reflect upon our own lives, we can say there are probably times in our life when we were tense. We were filled with fear. Things were not going our way. And to the point where we question where to go. Even as Christians, anxiety can creep in slowly and suddenly we find ourselves underwater and the stress gets too much and we wonder what will happen. And yet there are other times when we're more relaxed that suddenly the fear is gone. And this almost then brings us to the feet of Jesus in the midst of all that can happen in our lives, we think of King David fleeing maybe from the city of Caleb where he had been to liberate the city. And when he consults with the Lord, if the people from Caleb would turn him over into the, king's, the hand of the king of Saul when he hears that King Saul is approaching and the answer comes back, yes, they will. 
the breakdown that, that David had, and even the people of Israel, the people of the Lord, that he knew not where to go. Or we can think of David fleeing from Absalom, his own son, Absalom taking over the throne of Israel for a time. When we read about these events, when we read about David and all that he went through in his life, the dangerous situations, we can understand that he comes also to the Lord and he, 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 he presents to the Lord that which is in his heart. He's in a fearful situation. Things don't look good, as we can sometimes say in our lives. And even now, as we look at the country of Canada and we see how our government's acting, the incredible debt, the laws that are passed in the censorship laws, the laws against that which we consider good, that can cause us fear and anxiety. Our future, our children's future, our grandchildren's future, what's, what's going to happen? What's tomorrow going to look like? And so we too can come as David did into the presence of our Lord. And we see that when he had his opening words where, where David says, In you, O Lord, in you, O Lord, he comes to God. And the first thing he says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Before he even presents his case, that which is wrong, he comes to his God. He comes to his Lord, the one who's over his life, the one whom he had placed his trust. And he says, O Lord, I put my trust in you. You are my God. I belong to you. You are the one who has ownership to me. I am your servant. I, I look to you for my refuge and my strength. For David knew that there was no other place to go. There's only one true God. There's only one God who's over all things. One God who's in control of all things. And even though in the moment things may seem confusing and difficult to discern and to see how God is carrying out his plans also in the life of David, who God had promised that he would have the throne of Israel, that he'd been anointed to be the king of Israel, how would it all work out? David knew that the only place he could go was back to God. God was his refuge, and God was his strength. And so when you see, we read these words, and you, O Lord, do I take refuge? We see David going to the Lord and pouring his heart out to the Lord in this psalm. And then he says, and let me never be put to shame. That indeed, what you have promised, may those words indeed, those covenantal words, bear fruit in my life. May I stand firm before your throne. May your words be real in my life. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me and rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For all that God does is right and good. And our lives are in God's hands and even as we see everything around us seeming to collapse, we can say, but what God is doing in our life at this moment, even though it may seem fearless, is good. He's a good God, and He's working out in our lives His salvation. He's a righteous God. He has all things in His hands, and He's carrying out His plans exactly as He has planned Nothing escapes his attention. Everything's under control. We can trust him. He has all things in his hands. He is the one who is in control. Not our prime minister, not our government, not our leaders, not those who have high financial powers, political powers. God is the one who's in control, and his rule is a righteous rule. It's good for us. And so in some ways, or we can say, we can say, well, we are at this moment in this time. As, as, as David said later on in the Psalms, our, our times are in his hands. He's placed us here at this time, and it is good. 
in his sight, difficult as it may seem. Therefore, in you, O Lord, I do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. So first of all, the psalmist says, in you I take refuge. You are my strength. You are the righteous God. You are the one who is in control. But then he says, incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. On the one hand, he recognizes God's control, but at the same time, he feels the desperation of his situation, and God knows. God knows where we are. God knows what we need. And so the psalmist goes and he prays to God that God would hear him, that God would rescue him, that God would provide for him. Even as he knows that God will, at the same time, the fears and anxieties and the tensions can come into our lives. And so he pours out his heart to his God. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. But at the same time, he says, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. A rock of refuge, a stronghold, a fortress, a place to flee to into the hands of his God. So he prays that, and then in verse 3, he affirms that, for you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and you guide me. So on one hand, he prays that God would listen to him, and and on the other hand, he recognizes that God has listened to him and is listening to him and is looking after him and and, and taking care of him. He says, you take me out of the net, they have hidden from me, for you are my refuge. And then we had these words in verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And taking these words, we can look forward from the life of David to the cross of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. For there Christ Jesus is on the cross crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? me. And the question why, of course, is the same thing that David knew as he flees. He looks for a place of refuge. As he looks for a stronghold, a place for protection, he knows that in himself, in his own being, in his own life, he deserved nothing. You're all sinners. You've all gone astray. We don't deserve nothing from our God. The reason we can call ourselves God's people is because He has saved us. He has saved us by the blood of our precious Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, that blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. We celebrated on Good Friday that Jesus Christ was placed on the cross for our sins, for what we had done with that one price for all of our sins, he granted us salvation. So even as, as David looks to a refuge, he also has a promise that it's not by David's strength, it's not by his deeds, by his merit, by his goodness, but rather it's by the goodness of our Lord. What God has granted to us in His grace and His mercy, that He is the one who has saved us from all of our sins, that we can be His people, that we can dwell in His presence, that He can be our God, our rock, our refuge, our fortress. And so we, as in the midst of our lives, as we feel tensions, as we feel problems coming upon us and multiplying, when we think of our lives, when we pray to God, And Satan himself could come and accuse us. Why are you praying to God? You don't deserve it. You're a sinner. You've messed up. It's your fault. You're paying the consequences of your sins. You don't deserve anything from God. And we don't. But the accuser may accuse us. We have a Savior who died on the cross for His people to save them from all of their sins. And so God hears us through Christ Jesus and we see Christ in the cross of Calvary. And as we see Christ um, paying the price for our sins, that sacrifice, and then when he dies and he says, it is finished, into your hands I commit 
my spirit. Also, words that Stephen later on also says, into your hands I commit your spirit, my spirit. And we also can take those words and say, but our lives, our soul, our heart is in the hands of our Lord and Savior. He knows us intimately, all that's passing in our lives. Our hope and our strength is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. So he talks about that refuge. He talks about that, that, that confidence that he has in the Lord, that God is indeed with him. And then in verse 8 and 6, he, he goes to those who don't believe in Christ Jesus. He says, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols. Or other, other translations say, to vain things. Those who trust vain things. Worthless idols. To keep ourselves free from idol worship. On the one hand, we confess that we believe in God, that He's the God over all things. But at the same time, it's so easy to put our hope in that which in the end is hopeless. To trust in this world, but this world will always let us down. The idols that we make with our own minds will always fail us because our only imaginations of a mind that's been given over to sin. And we must seek to dispel these images from our minds, these idols from our minds, the sin that dwells so easily within us. Spurgeon talks about taking a lamb and looking into his heart. We can use a flashlight. We have these flashlights today that are very brilliant. And he talks about looking into your heart and finding the sin that dwells there and rooting it out. But he says, but I take that light, that lamp, that flashlight every single day and seek it every single day to keep on. Just like weeds that grow in your gardens, they so easily take root, they so easily grow, but just to keep looking and keep looking and take them out, pull them out. Because Satan continually continues to stimulate our minds to put our confidence in that which will not save us. Not our monies, not our good, not our possessions, not our jobs, not who we are, not our, not, not, not our creative thoughts, but rather to put our trust in God. He is our refuge. He is our strength. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. When the going gets tough, where do you put your trust? Do you put your trust truly in God? Do you look to God? Do you plead with God to listen and to listen and to provide relief, to be a refuge in the midst of all that the world can throw at us? Because He's the only one that can provide. There is no other place to go. He's the one who's seated upon the throne. And yet Satan will continually tempt us to put our trust somewhere else, but it will always fail. God is our only help. God is our only strength. And to look to Christ, the cross of Christ. He died for our sins. He died for our sins. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He has all the power and the authority. He's the one who has dominion over all things. All things are in His hands. And then Psalmist continues in verse 9. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. He presents what he's going through. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. David again presents the situation in which he finds himself. It's a dire situation. Afflictions of the body, weakness in the body, Tribulations in the body and weakness and tribulations in the soul. David was a man just like we are. He also suffered. 
He suffered torment. We think of Ab- when, you, when Absalom is, 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 is killed, the sorrow David felt in his own soul. And again, he could so easily say, but this is a consequence of my sins. What I had, what I had done, that is which I'm reaping. So he could pour out his situation before his Lord and recognize that even as his strength fails because of his iniquity and his bones waste away, yet he can pray to God saying, but be gracious to me, O Lord, for it's not by what we have done, it's by what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. It's his salvation for us. It's not by what we deserve, but what he grants to us in his mercy, that we have life in him. And then David speaks about the enemy. He says, because he, he says, speaking of the enemy, because all because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I've been, I have been forgotten like one who's dead. I become like a, a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life, as they plot to take away my life. And so in, when we think of verse 1, where he, where he summarizes all that, when he says, let me never be put to shame, he, he thinks of all those who see him, an outcast, driven away, and they ridicule him, they mock him, and they deride him. And so he comes to his God, and he prays to God that God indeed would see and have mercy. Again, we can only see so far. We look toward the future. What's going to be the future like? But then David comes to the Lord and he prays that the Lord would and will deliver him at that time. And we can at this time also come to our Lord and pray to him and ask that he will deliver us and provide us all that we stand in need of. He's our God and he's our Lord. For I hear the whispering of many terror on every side as a scheme together against me, as a plot to take my life. And isn't that true today as well? We see the enemies at the cross. We see the enemies at the church. In other countries such as China, in India, in African countries, but also here in Canada, the creeping, the creeping ever so slowly but incrementally the, 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 ridiculing, the ridiculing of the church of Christ, the mocking of those who follow what God says is good, and the evil around us saying that which is good is evil and that which is evil is good, the ridiculing of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's in the crew. He hears. He hears all these things. He knows what's happening. He sees our situation. He's the one who's over all things. He has our lives in our hands. As, as David says in verse 14, But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. This time in which we live, this time is in the hand of the Lord. Just as the time of David, as he has to flee, he was in God's hand. We think of that time when Christ came to this earth and lived among us knowing that he one day would take upon himself all the burden of our sin and take upon himself the curse of God for our sin. And there he is on the cross of Calvary. His time, that which God had ordained to send his son to this world to die for our sins. And he dies he dies on the cross of Calvary and he commits his spirit to the Lord and he's, he's buried and in three days he rises again from the dead. He's victorious. He breaks the bonds of death. He lives again. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors as God rescued David. As God sent his son 
on the cross to die for our sins, and as Christ conquers death and rises again from the dead, so we can have our hope placed in our God that we too will live with Him. And as Christ rises, we rise with Christ. We have life in Christ. He is our God, and He's the one who's granted eternal life as we listen to the voice of our Savior. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. The grace of our Lord, because all by grace, not by what our hands have done, not by our merit, but by the merit of the Son of God, Jesus. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Let the lion lips be mute, which speak instantly against the righteous in pride and contempt. The lying lips that lie all the time. And isn't it true that we live in the midst of a lying generation and they have no shame as they lie and as they lie and they lie all the time. It, it's unreal how bad it can get that they say the weirdest things, the most illogical things against all truth. And this whole, whole the, the mastering of the lie stimulated by Satan himself to just present to us that which is not true, but God hears every single lie. He knows what they're saying. He knows what they're doing. He knows what they're planning. And so David says, let the lying lips be mute, which speak instantly against the righteous in pride and contempt. So on the one hand, he presents that generation at that time. We think again, as David flees through Israel, and he even had to flee outside of Israel because he knew not where to turn. His own people were against him. Were not, he could not trust them. It break their promises. They would lie. And so David flees, and he, he flees to his only refuge, to the God, and he presents his case to our God. And we think of Christ Jesus. Even though he's found innocent, he's crucified. We think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees lying and lying and lying all the time, false witnesses to accuse him. And Christ Jesus is crucified in spite of Christ being the truth, the only way to salvation, the only way to the Father, who only spoke the truth. And so after presenting what this world is like, the lies, and that there, there is in this world, then the David says in verse 19, but oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men, you store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. So, so David then presents his case before the Lord and he recognizes, but God does is good, it's right. He's the one who is over all things. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. As we take refuge in the Lord, the Lord sees, the Lord provides. He grants that which we stand in need of. So David says then, verse 21, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in the besieged city. I said in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight, but you have heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Blessed be the Lord, God, the fount of all blessing. And David then extols. He gives praise and glory to his God, knowing that his God will provide and is providing and will never let him down. The body they may kill, but our souls are in the hands of our God. We commit our spirit to our God, and we can trust that he's watching over us. And if the world takes our life from us, as Paul says, when I die, I will be 
with my Lord, which is, in the end, far better. We'll be there in paradise, worshiping with the saints forevermore, eternally, in the presence of our God. The world may throw everything at us, but the, the body they may kill, but our soul belongs to our God. And that is our comfort in life and in death, that we belong to our God and He will never forsake us. And that's why the psalmist can say, Blessed be the Lord, blessed be the Lord, for He has wondrously shown His steadfast love to me and He will continue to love me to the very end and forevermore. I had said in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. We can come to our God. We can come before His throne of grace because we come to His throne of grace in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. His sacrifice opened up that way into the most holy place that we can go to our God in the name of Jesus and present all that trouble, all that troubles us, all that causes us anxiety and pain and sorrow. With confidence, He is our refuge. He'll lessen. He'll never forsake us. He'll always provide for us. And so as we look at the psalm, as we look at the psalms, ask yourself, do I have that confidence? Are there times when I find my faith so weak that I know not where to go? Or do I find myself being pulled one way or, or another to put my trust in that which in the end will fail because it's not of God? It's only a vain, a vain attempt, a vain imagination, a worthless idol. Do I truly know that my time, this time, the time in which I live, is in the hands of my God and He will never, ever forsake us? Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He fulfilled the will of His Father. He died for our sins. And because He died for our sins, we belong to Him if we truly have faith in Him through the Holy Spirit. Trust in our God. May He be a strong refuge for you. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, there can be doubt. There can be temptations. We confess there can be much sin in our life. That sin can easily block out the sight of our victorious Lord who conquered death, who conquered the grave, who arose, a victor, who ascended to heaven and sits at your right hand. We can easily doubt and then despair. O oh Lord God, may we hold fast on to your promises. May we hold on to that which you have granted to us. Faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. May he indeed be our rock and our fortress. A strong place to go to. Be with each and every one of us in the struggles of our lives. We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our song of response is number 331B, verses 1 through 5. 31B, 1 through 5, we'll stand to sing.
offering is for the Anchor Association, and our song of thanks during the offering is 356. We'll now stand to confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to be judged the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our parting song of praise is number 570.
receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.